all doing great. And for me, it was really very important to be here, to see your faces. And I honestly do appreciate people who, despite their very tight schedules, they have to even send videos because they can hear. They can be here. I almost did the same. But for me, walking, talking, and also interacting with adolescents is something that I live for. And I'm really glad to be here today and to also say thank you to the organizers and to everyone who has spoken before I did. And you know, it happens that ever since I came in here, everyone that has spoken are all females. I'm like, oh, Margaret, your work is done. What else do you want to say? Because at the end of it, it's just to say, whether you're a boy or a girl, you should not be limited. It doesn't matter what the society tells you. It doesn't matter how people view you. But what is important is that you believe in yourself and you know that you can be all that God has created you to be. And I usually like to start with this story. I have some couple of pictures. There is one. You don't have any? Okay, it's loading. Maybe when it comes, then you see the small thing. Now, growing up for me, right, I thought I was really vulnerable. And it was just for one reason. I was a girl and not a boy. That was just why I felt I was vulnerable. Interestingly, I mean, on top of feeling that way, I was surrounded by six sisters. So we were seven of us. And it's okay to say it was a girl's hostel. And usually, anytime I ask my mom, like, wow, seven, I'm like the fifth. Why seven? I wanted a boy. <laughs> and that's why I had to go that long route. Of course, she didn't get a boy, but she has a lot of grandsons. <laughs> and she's happy with the girls that she has. But you know, for me, even as I speak to you this afternoon, I guess, right? I still remember vividly the pitiable faces of concerned, concerned in court, friends and family, feeling sorry for my parents because they have girls as children, like seven of them. Who does that, right? But I can't forget that particular voice, and it came from a woman. So before you think, oh, Margaret is here to turn girls against boys, no. It's really the society that has kept us where we are. It's boys are special, girls are special. And you know what she said? She would keep asking my mom, who has a minimal education, to say, why are you working tirelessly? She had a shop, she was doing a lot, doing business, because you're spending too much scarce resources on mere females. After all, they'll get married, go to their husband's house, be in the kitchen, and probably the other room, you know what I mean? And that's the end of it. But interestingly, as young as I was, just like you, I felt it was unacceptable because I had two options, to feel bad and believe that was true, or to say, no, this is not true. I can be all that I want to be. And you know, for me, I had really big dreams. I never for once, I'm not into politics yet, I don't know what it looks like, but if there's one dream I dream of or want to, is to be the United Nations Secretary General. But even as a then, as a teenager, for me, I never dreamt of being a president's wife. I wanted to be the president. I read so much about Ben Carson, Gifted Ernst, and I was thinking of being one renowned neurosurgeon. I was just, my dreams were really big. And of course, my faith in God was very strong and still very strong. And I just believed that, see, I could be all that I wanted to be. And regardless of whether I was a male or a female, I wanted to put a smile on my mom's face, absolutely, for all the labors. I also wanted my dad to be a proud father of girls, all girls. And I wanted to leave that my purpose that God has asked me to leave on this earth. So those were for me the driving force beyond what the society kept on telling me that you can do A, you can do B. And the only reason is because 
I'm a girl. But did I say that I felt vulnerable? Yes, I did. But I found myself in a rural community in Zaria, Kaduna State, which is where I grew up. So I proudly tell people that I'm a northern Yoruba girl, whatever that means to you. So my parents are both from Oshun State. However, I was born in Kaduna State. So I speak Hausa as much as I speak Yoruba. Thanks to my parents for making sure we speak Yoruba at home. So for me, I just started looking at issues when I started visiting these rural communities. You know why I did not now feel, oh, okay, oh, it's not the full picture. You will have seen the area of the girls. And then there's another one when I was younger. Yes, yeah, so this picture, right? I don't know if I was five or six, but I didn't even bother to ask my mom. I'll tell you why. I have two birthdays. Second and third of December. And that was because someone took me to school and re registered me, my date of birth, as second of December. And all my life, I was enjoying second December. Isn't it cool? And then suddenly, I lost my grandfather, and then we went to the village, Elisha to be precise, in Oshun State. And then I was just searching things and looking for things, and then I found that card. You know that card is Omoloruko, that naming ceremony card, small one. My, my, my parents were not the typical Yorubas that would write 100 names. You know how we give printers issues when it comes to Yoruba? It was just three names. It was Margaret, Omolola, Idowu. So I have twins ahead of me who are girls, absolutely. And then it was like born on 3rd December. Like, excuse me, I've always known second. How comes? And then I ran to my mom. I'm like, what happened? So I see, thank God for technology. You know the year that you were born. Scroll through. Anyone that is Saturday inside, that's your date of birth. And then it finally turned out to be third. But by that time, I'd written exams and all of that. And, you know, just changing all of those stuff. So, like, I give them that assignment. They have to get me gifts and at least do a call on second and third of December. So, you see why I won't bother to even ask how old I am here. Before she tells me it's six and then maybe it's seven. I don't know. But I was very much, am I not pretty? Okay. So, back to our story, right? When I visited those rural communities, for me, it was just seeing girls and women bound by harmful cultural practices. So when we talk about harmful cultural practices, I love to connect to my roots. I'm proud to be Nigerian. I'm proud to be a Yoruba girl. I'm proud to be Hausa if by naturalization or so. I'm also proud to be an African. But we also have to understand that we have limiting cultural practices. Female genital mutilation is one of them. Child marriage. And anytime I talk about child marriage, the voice that comes to me is that of Aisha. And this is an intelligent girl. We started working in that community. These were communities where girls were dying for things that should have been averted. Vesico vagina fistula. You're too young to bring a baby. Your pelvis is too narrow. But because the culture says you get married at either 11, 12, it doesn't matter. Or someone, in fact, the, for some persons, monarchy, which is the first time you see your menstruation, means you're saying goodbye to your parents. You then get, the next one has to meet you in your husband's house. And this way, girls, we were very intelligent, but will walk up to me and say, oh, and Samun Rana, and what that means in Hausa, in English, it's a wedding date has been fixed for me. I need to get married. Some of them, because they've gone through some sessions, they can negotiate, they'll tell you, oh, okay, it's okay, I'll get married, but the husband has to sign that I continue my education, even after the wedding. But we know how things happen. Then she gets pregnant because she's unable to even decide for her own body when she wants to start having babies. And when that happens, morning sickness struck. People react differently or feel differently to all of those things. And then education gets stuck. 
It doesn't mean that she can't continue, but she's been limited by all of those other issues, a whole lot of them. Now, the issue is for me, when I saw that they were dying needlessly and unable to live out their dreams, I offered to help. And that was when I will, the society would have actually said, oh, it's okay that she just sits at home. She can go to school, but nothing really comes out. Became a founder. And currently, we have an organization, Stand With A Girl Initiative. I love to say SWAG, because when you pick the first letter of each, SWAG Initiative. We're in seven states in Nigeria. We've had advocacy at different levels. But importantly for me is that I have that opportunity, myself and my team, to connect to other girls. And interestingly, we engage with boys. I have to say this. So this is not in any way to say we have nothing to do with boys. But the truth is, if you look at the data, there's so much disservice that has been done to the girl child. And that's why today, I'm here to tell you that when you look at a human being, regardless of who they are, whether they are males or female, what first comes to you is that this person is a human. I don't know if you get it. Because until we remove that, that tag, of saying, oh, this is what she's limited to do. And I know for some people, oh, why should you go to the hospital and they say, this is a nurse, or the nurse is coming. What comes to mind? What comes to mind? The nurse is coming. A what? A lady, right? Or you go to a restaurant or somewhere like, oh, the cook, the chef, the man, good. Now, we're, we're, I'm sure, in fact, they will tell you the best chef in the world is probably a male and all of that. But in some cases, tradition, culture will limit you to what you can be. But you have to also tell yourself that, no, I can be all that I have been created to be. And, you know, it's also important to remind us that for my mom, people constantly reminded her that she was raising us for her husbands, but my mom knew better. Even with her minimal Western education, she only completed primary six when she lost her dad. She did not only raise wives and mothers as expected, she raised world changers, which I am proud to be one of them, through hard work, grace, and doggedness. Today, I am educated. Education, although they finish, Abby. I'm still on my way to even getting more degrees, so help me God. A world changer, championing the education, health, and rights of marginalized women and girls. But life has taught me some very key lessons, and I would like to drop them with you. They're probably, they might probably sound like a cliche. You know, in the global space, working as the youth representative, I was the only young person and of course, the youngest among 18 persons, global reference group. And this was actually my first opportunity to meet in person with Bill Gates, whatever opinion you have about him, that's on another note. But the truth is, I asked myself what actually brought me to this table. And a lot of young people say, we need a table, a table or a seat at the table. I tell you, if they don't give you one, carry one. Even if it's a mat, carry it for yourself and take it there. The most important thing is that your voices are represented. Another thing I also need to let you know that you stay strong when the journey gets tough. So it's not going to be moi moi. It won't just come to you easily. You have to walk at it. You have to believe in it and give what it takes to be able to get to that point that you want to. You should and must live your dreams. It's your right to live your dream, and you should. I know that there are a lot of limiting factor just by being a Nigerian. It's a lot of issue already, right? But if you decide to say, I want to live my dream, then you can. You should also go for your dream and live it to the fullest. 
And to cap, up, to cap it off, I like to say that today, I'm still a girl, if you consider me as a girl and not a woman, or whichever way, and not a boy or a man. And I'm a very happy girl, a very happy woman. So when we talk about whether male or female, or we talk about equality as being humanity, it's no girl saying we want to be boys, far from it. Be proud, carry the tag with all elegance. Be happy to carry it. It is all saying that we can be all that we've been created to be. Every girl and every woman deserve more, and I am on my way to fulfilling my dreams. I started by telling you that I want to become the United Nations Secretary General. It's a dream I'm working at, and I know by the grace of God, I'm going to get there. But I'm just here today to tell you that do not let the society limit you. And that you have a role to play. The next time you look at someone, your sister, your classmate, or your classmate, or that girl, and say, oh, you, you can't do this. You're too weak. You're also contributing to the problem. Together, we can ensure that we live our dreams and even make Nigeria better make the world a better place. Thank you so very much.